welcome to The Career Studio, a USU career services podcast that helps you navigate your career path. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armitstead, your host, and I'm thrilled to have Matthew Vance here with me today. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. So Matt is as creative as they come. He attended Utah State University to earn his bachelor's degree in business administration, and he minored in marketing. He currently works as the employee experience manager at Maloof. So he oversees the collection and the use of all employee feedback for over 500 employees there. He also leads the development for employee happiness programs and evaluates the initiative impacts. Matt was a recipient of the 2020 Utah Business HR Professional of the Year Award and has been instrumental in securing Maloof as a seven-time nationally ranked best place to work. Matt is currently authoring a review management book and he has consulted many organizations in various industries. His feedback management methodologies have been nationally recognized with a 2019 Gold Stevie Award. Matt currently lives in Logan, Utah with his wife and three daughters. He enjoys running cycling, (laughs) and cheesy jokes. So with that in mind, Matt, I'm really hoping that you have a great pun to share with us today. No pressure. (laughs) Well, one of my favorite jokes is when does a cheesy joke become a dad joke? And then when the punchline becomes a parent. Oh my gosh. (laughs) You know, my husband and I, we've been prepping for some future day when we have kids. And I think we've got some great dad jokes lined up and I'll have to add that to our list. (laughs) Yep, put it in. It's a good one. <laughs> That's great. Well, in addition to Matt's great puns, he also mentioned that he is the mastermind behind the creation of the mural on Andy's restaurant in downtown Logan. Lots of people have seen that, especially if you're an Aggie. So tell me more about this project. Why did you start it? When did you start it? Give us a little bit of background. Yeah, so I started that project in the fall of 2013. So it was my senior year at the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State. And I had been inspired by some marketing material from Professor Bartkus, his class. Uh, We were talking about point of purchase advertising. And one day I was driving down Main Street with my wife and we stopped at the intersection on 700 North and I saw Angie's and I was like, that's like prime advertising real estate and it's not being used. So one thing led to another and I ended up going into the restaurant and pitching the idea of using that real estate on, on the restaurant. And instead of just making it an ad, we wanted it to be something that added to the character of the business. And they put art on the inside of their restaurant. So it made sense to put art on the outside of the business, also created by local artists. So it was definitely a fun project. My first attempt at contracting work on my own. So it was really fun. And and I'm really curious. So it sounds like some of the motivation behind it was you kind of just saw an opportunity. You saw this blank, almost billboard, right? Just waiting to be used. So I think that's really cool. And I also love love that, you know, I was doing a little bit of research about this project and it sounds like it was more of an initiative. You got other people to get involved. So talk to me a little bit more about that. So we wanted to focus on the journey to the mural, not just the end project itself. So we ended up um, creating a contest where local artists could submit art. It would be voted on by people at the restaurants in the front lobby. And then that's how we would choose who would help create this mural and include iconic items from around the valley on the mural. So if you go look at the mural, it's definitely a, a collaboration between a lot of people. We had over a dozen artists ranging in age from like middle school all the way to full adults. So it was wow. it was definitely a, a fun coordination between a lot of people, but we wanted it to be something that could stand the test of time. And we even put a 20 year graffiti proof spray over that thing. So Oh, wow. I didn't even think about that. Six years, so it should last at least 14 more. Wow. That's such a cool project. And I'm kind of curious. I know you mentioned a couple of the skills like collaboration that you learned. Was there anything else that you learned from that process? Because if I remember right, I I don't think it was a paid contract. You were kind of just doing it for the experience. Is that right? Yeah. So the way I pitched it to Sabor, the owner of the restaurant, was I could make potential profit off of paid entrance to the art contest, but then I would also have to pay the cash prizes. And that was kind of a roll of the dice on my side. I had estimated that I could make a few thousand dollars if everything went right, but we didn't get near as many 
applications as I expected, even after soliciting participation from all the different schools in the Valley. So I ended up paying $600 out of pocket to do this project. Wow. And uh, that was probably the one downside at the time when you're on a tight college budget. But For sure. <laughs> um, I learned a lot. I learned that there's always way more to give and to get in a creative project like that. There was a lot more time involved, a lot more collaboration, a lot more leadership on several different levels from working with the artists, working with the restaurants, working with the general public. And it definitely challenged me, but I thrive under pressure. So as soon as it became real and someone was counting on an end result to be delivered, then it just helped me step up. Absolutely. What a cool start to your career. I think that's such a unique experience that not a lot of people have. So that's awesome. And to kind of transition a little bit here, I'm really interested in learning more about your current position. So you're an employee experience manager. Talk to us a little bit about what that means. (laughs) So it's a slightly atypical role. You're starting to see more companies trend this way now where they're caring about the employee experience, kind of like customer experience. You have different stakeholders in the business. You've got external people, the people that are using your products and investors. and But employees have historically not been given as much care and attention as people that are paying for services and products. So it's definitely a new initiative in general, but I didn't start there. Uh, it was actually just something that kind of evolved in, in my career. When I joined Maloof in 2014, I was just hired to be the review guy. Um, it was a very ambiguous position. <laughs> we, at the time, we only had two online channels that we were doing e-commerce sales on, Amazon and Amazon CA or Amazon Canada. And my job was to monitor all the reviews and customer feedback. And as things started to grow, you know, we eventually opened up business on a lot of different channels. We went from two channels to over 50 different channels in the course of about four, four and a half years. And wow. I grew a team that managed all those reviews and helped spearhead some methodologies to to translate all that text feedback to actionable items to help us innovate our products faster. And in the process, I realized we could do the same thing with employee feedback, just like what we're doing with customer feedback. And eventually I proposed the creation of my current position and that I should fill it. And that's kind of how I got to the position I'm in now. I'm doing a similar thing. It's all feedback management and leveraging what people are saying to make things better. And instead of working with customers, now I'm working with the employees. So interesting, Matt. And I'm kind of curious to learn more about the day-to-day. So it sounds like you work a lot with people. And are you currently working with employees like face-to-face? Well, I guess maybe in this virtual world, maybe it's not face-to-face, but talk to me a little bit about what that interaction looks like. Uh, Sure. So the day-to-day can vary quite a lot, but some of the things that I typically do is I check our online profiles like Glassdoor and Comparably and Indeed. And we're also on one called InHerSite. On those profiles, employees can go on and rate their experience at Maloof. So I go and check for new reviews and new feedback there every day. And if there's something new, I'm responding in a similar way that I used to do on the customer feedback side, responding to reviews on Amazon. And I also check our suggestion box. We have an anonymous suggestion box that's online. And I'm also working with internal service providers such as Maloof's Kitchen or Salon to help them enhance their services for our customers, the employees, based on feedback. But one of the most critical pieces is working with people themselves. I have interviews and conversations with people casually and formally all the time to try to help maintain the, the personal touch. And we don't want to dehumanize managing the employee experience by just looking at numbers and surveys. Sure. We want to keep a strong relationship with individuals. And so that's also important. And all of that combined doesn't really matter much unless we're actually taking action. And so one of the biggest pieces is also working with the leadership team on driving real change. One change that we recently implemented was launching a new in-house built one-on-one tracking system. One-on-ones is basically a meeting between a manager and an employee. And it's where relationships get strengthened. Expectations are for a role or a project are made sure that they're on the same page on both sides. And it's where people can talk about how they're doing, how they're feeling. And we want that to be a very meaningful thing. We've seen through our employee engagement data that it's highly impactful. So those meetings matter a lot and we want to make sure that they're tracked 
And so that was a new program that we totally launched last week. Oh my goodness. Well, and I was looking at the, the company culture of Maloof and it is unlike a lot of places. I think they said they have like a basketball court and like a eating area, like where they prepare you fancy food. And anyways, so what a cool place to work and what a cool job to have. I am also kind of wanting to know a little bit more just about some of the critical points um, throughout your career that got you to this point. You know, oftentimes we look back and there were certain experiences maybe in school or maybe just in one stepping stone job that kind of led you to this job now. And so maybe thinking back on your time at USU or a previous job, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the steps that kind of led to where you are? Yeah, of course. Thanks for that, Marissa. So in a podcast like this, you may only hear the fun, shiny things, the exciting things, the big victories, but really behind the scenes, there's always a lot more to anyone's story. We're all people. We all have struggles and victories, but for me, at least getting to where I am definitely wasn't easy. Um, Before I started at Maloof, I applied for 54 different positions at different companies. And that number was significant to me. Wow, that's a lot. I counted all the emails. Yeah, it was a lot. Just because that was probably one of the hardest challenges I've had in my life up to that point. I was on the track team. I had good grades. I felt like I had lots of opportunities that came my way. But then getting rejected that many times throughout my senior year and then after graduation, that really was hard and it affected me for sure. But I just kept going because there's really nothing else you can do except keep trying. And eventually I was offered the position at this little company that no one heard about called Maloof. There were less than 40 people there working at the time. And I was offered a job that really wasn't very defined. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to go for it and see what I can make of this. And as I started that role, I just told myself, you know, I need to prove that I was worth hiring every day instead of just, hey, I got in the door once, but I'm going to prove that day after day after day. I think that really helped. I was able to gain trust quickly and I was given additional projects and the importance of the projects continued to grow. And now I'm in a role that I pretty much created, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. And we're really honing in on and focusing in on networking this month. I'm curious to learn more about the role that networking played, maybe in finding the job and also currently as you kind of created this job. Tell us a little bit more about the role networking played. Sure. For for this position specifically, network working with Professor Sterling Bone was actually the key. He was leading the Huntsman Marketing Association group at the time in, in 2014 when I graduated. And he had posted that there was a position at Maloof on the LinkedIn group page for HMA. And so I just reached out to him and said, hey, do you know anyone over there? And he made a connection to someone that was working there. And that ended up in me getting a first interview. I do think that networking is very powerful. I've seen that it's benefited me in other ways as well, personally and professionally. But at least for my career path, yeah, there was definitely a component of networking there. Well, Matt, you mentioned that it sounds like you connected with a great professor and that kind of led to some opportunities. I think sometimes for students, people tell them, especially I can definitely say in career services, you know, we recommend they reach out to their professors and start building those networks. What were some of the strategies or ways that you kind of built that relationship so that the professor thought of you when you were looking for those opportunities? Um, I would say be a student that cares. Don't just be there to be there. Sure, if if you want to float through college and just get that graduation certificate, you can. But if you want to fully capitalize on the opportunity at hand, get to know people, especially because they, they are plugged in in a lot of ways to a lot of people that can help you. But don't just do it to be self-serving. Do it to find ways to give back. And as you give back, you will be given opportunities as well. One thing I have seen from going to a lot of different career fairs at different universities and interviewing, going through lots of resumes, there is a very real difference in people who care and are proactive about their career compared to the people who are just present and passively going through the motions. And it will result, in my opinion, in very different trajectories when you're looking at the end of your career. So take control of it because no one is in charge of your career more than you. 
Couldn't agree more, Matt. I think that's great advice. Starting as soon as you can. And again, it, I think it really goes back to that piece of it's all about who you know. And to some degree, I've really seen that play out in my life as well. That if you have that connection that just happens to have that one opportunity, you just never know where it's going to lead. And so I think being proactive, like you mentioned, is, is a really great strategy for beginning those networks as we start out. So we've talked a little bit about how networking kind of got you to that job. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about networking now that you have this great job. How do you manage those relationships and how do you build those relationships? Well, I think there's two sides to that. I would say you've got the personal side and you've got the digital side. The personal side is when you see people in the community or at work, and this could be networking even within your own company, like be nice to people, ask how they're doing and see what's going on in their lives, facilitate conversations about them and show that you care about what's happening in their world. Uh, On the digital side, it's pretty much the same, but you're leveraging social media, email, texts, phone calls. Calls. Uh, my personal favorite is LinkedIn. I'm a huge advocate of LinkedIn. I've seen that it's very powerful in a lot of different ways. I've actually worked with Ashley Willis. She's our social media manager at Maloof on a training for employees at Maloof to better leverage LinkedIn for their own careers. And you know, there's a lot of value that can be had there in connecting with people, but also learning. You know, if you subscribe to content that is of interest to you, it's going to help you learn faster and connect with people in different groups or different companies who, who have insights on topics that matter to you that you, know, you may not have known. So if you participate in those groups and those online communities, you're more likely to be introduced to people who could also help you in your career. Yeah, I love that. And I have to say, I am also a huge LinkedIn fan. It's amazing what technology allows us to do now. 30 years ago, if you wanted to meet somebody in an industry, you had to find a phone book and look it up and try and see if you could contact them that way. And LinkedIn makes that so easy. You could talk to somebody in a different country in a matter of minutes just by sending a quick message their way. So I really think that is a powerful tool that students can use. And I often refer them to that as they try to expand their networks. So I think that's some great advice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move into a slightly different question. How do you define success and how do you know that you've attained that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great question, Marissa. It's one that I've personally thought a lot about. By about 2018, I felt like I was kind of stagnant at Maloof in my position. I felt like I'd figured everything out when it came to customer reviews and online reviews. And in a one-on-one meeting with my manager, he challenged me to find a different way to learn and grow. And ultimately, I decided to look for maybe a book or some type of a conference I could attend to learn more about online reviews. And as I started searching, there really wasn't anything that existed. There were no conferences and there were no books since there has been one other book published. But that got me thinking like, well, how can I learn more? How can I grow? And eventually I just, I recognized that my past learnings and past growth up to that point had happened from reading scholarly articles and training other people in my team on how to improve. So connecting those two dots, I realized, you know, I need to just keep researching. I need to keep teaching. And if I can do those two things, even if there isn't a conference or a book that already exists, you know, I can carve a path where, where I'm learning, growing, teaching other people. And ultimately that's why I decided to start writing a book and it really fueled my personal credo or belief about career success. And that's a a very long lead in to say my definition of career success is improving at a faster rate than your competition. If you don't know what your competition is doing, you don't know how fast they're growing, how fast they're improving. So you have to seek improvement for yourself, but don't put up the blinders. You need to be aware of what's happening around you. Now, if you don't do that, you could be stuck in something that I call the mirage of success. That's where you are actually improving. You can see it, but you're improving like this and your competition is improving at a faster rate. And so in research for my book and in with a goal to improve faster than other people, I still look online and I'm, I'm continuously looking at other companies in the review management space and reading blog articles and other content to know what's happening around me to be better informed. And at the same time, I'm putting in hours in the morning and on the weekends extra outside of my job to own my own career and try to grow faster than the status quo. 
I think that's a really interesting insight about success. And I think oftentimes we reflect on our personal growth for sure. And, you know, we can see that personal growth and I think there can be satisfaction in that. But I love this other component of comparing it to other industries or other people in the industry to kind of see where we're falling. And I think that can be tough sometimes because even if we're making great personal growth, it may not make a difference. And as we're entering this new world of virtual technology, a lot of people, a lot of students are having to really make this hard transition to doing something they've never done before. And so I think having this mindset of personal growth, but also knowing your competition, because this is going to be the difference between you getting the job or them getting the job. So not just knowing yourself, but also being aware of those around you, I think is a really interesting insight. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. All right. So Matt, we're going to wrap things up here in just a minute, but I really want to ask you one final question. If you could give students any advice, one piece, one golden nugget of advice about having a networking mindset wherever they go, what would that be? No, that's a good question. I would say be a giver, not a taker. Don't always think about what it, what's in it for you, even though that's maybe what comes natural. Think about what you can offer others. What can you do that isn't expected or that you have an obligation to do? And as you go out of your way to help others and to lift others, you will be lifted at the same time. And you'll have opportunities and experiences that will come to you that wouldn't have been there otherwise. I love that, Matt. And I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball and it's totally fine if you don't want to answer this, but I'm curious, have there been times where that's played out in your own life where either you were able to help somebody and that proved to be you know, helpful down the road or vice versa when somebody simply did something nice for you and that helps you in your career? I think that's a, I appreciate you asking that. There have been some interesting opportunities I've had that have just kind of developed. One of my favorites is I've had the chance to work with Logan City and with the Logan City Police Department on a volunteer basis, doing some volunteer consulting. They've had some interesting things happen recently. There's a lot of tension and conflict that has reached kind of a pinnacle recently with the police. But going back even two years ago, I was able to see kind of what police officers live on a day to day. Maloof has a foundation where we fight human trafficking. And that was kind of the tie in to working with the local law enforcement where we collaborate with organizations like OUR and other law enforcement agencies to help protect children. And on a local level, we wanted to be involved with our local police officers and they needed a little bit of help on the reputation side with their online reviews. So it ended up opening a door to help volunteer. Now, once that project was done, I just kind of caught this bug of just, man, they have such a hard job. And I know I couldn't do it. And so I wanted to do something else to help. And me and my family, we ended up doing a fundraiser to sell snow cones and raise money for tourniquets. Uh, we asked the police chief what they could use that would benefit them instead of asking for, hey, fund some party or something like that. They specifically asked for a life-saving device that could be used for their officers. And so that's what we saved money for with this fundraiser. And we were able to deliver, deliver 60 tourniquets this last January to the Logan City Police. And just going through that whole process, it was kind of like the mural where I didn't quite know what I was getting into, but I felt very strongly that we needed to do something to help the officers. More officers die by suicide than in the line of duty. It's a very taxing position. And so being able to do something small like that and give back was extremely rewarding. And it's opened doors to have other conversations with for-profit consulting for me personally, which was also beneficial. Matt, thank you so much for sharing that really personal example. I really appreciate that. And, and I think it helps illustrate this idea of being genuine. You know, when we think about networking, I think sometimes it comes off as how can we brag about ourselves and be, you know, the most egotistical form of ourselves? You know, this is why I'm so great. And I think sometimes we forget that networking is all a two-way street. It's all about how can we help each other, right? And so I think that example really hits home and, and really helps illustrate that point. Well, Matt, you have been so great on the show today. I, I really appreciate your genuineness and your openness, willing to talk about sometimes kind of personal things, you know, especially with career choices. So I really, really appreciate you having you on the show today. Yeah, of course. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Marissa. Definitely. To learn more about Matt and his upcoming book, you can connect with him on LinkedIn and follow his YouTube channel. Links to both are in our bio below. 
Thanks for joining us here at the Career Studio today. Please remember to join us next week as we continue to discuss this month's theme of how to have a networking mindset wherever you go. 